All right. Hey, before we start though, tonight's events, we ask you please no flash photography or videotaping. If we see it, we will confiscate, confiscate your stuff and you'll lose it. But um, aside from that, now brought to you by the Student Activity Board, which is of California PA. He is the author of two New York Times bestsellers, the novel TTM Brown and two children's books. He is Cactus Jack, Dude Love, and Mankind. But most importantly, he is Mrs. Fa Mrs. Foley's baby boy. Please welcome Mick Foley. Music. Hold on, I know you guys are excited to see me. That's a very nice thing, but I, is there something wrong with these people up there? Am I showing up as a wrestler or am I coming here as a college lecturer? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know who's in charge of the music. I'm sorry, but I just, you know, I feel like those days when I used to come out to the stupid little guitar music and the car crash are over, and now I'm, I'm a lecturer, I, I'm a New York Times number one best selling author, and and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to pick up the pieces here. I don't mean to ruin it for you guys, but I, where's the little guy with the shirt who gave me the introduction? <laughs> right. I, I don't, I don't wanna walk out. I know a lot of people are looking forward to this thing, but I think it'd be nice if you gave me an introduction and I came out some music that might be a little bit more appropriate, okay? Give it another try. I <laughs> uh, didn't expect to see that one coming. Um, uh, sorry about that, Mr. Foley, but once again, Mick Foley. I'm a nice man. Yeah, I'm a nice man. Yeah! I the home. I love the home. Okay, that's it. There you go, that's my little creative uh, introduction here. I figure every time I just started doing these, these uh, speeches uh, regularly, before that I'd just show up when someone asked me to, you know, I never actually pursued it. And then a college heard, or a speaking agency heard that a wrestler was at a school that they were also representing a speaker at and heard that I did a good job and asked me if I wanted to start speaking more regularly. I was like, Man, uh, cheap pops, no injuries, that sounds good to me. So uh, I'm always kicking myself because I could conceivably be the only college lecturer in the world with his own entrance music. <laughs> and this is the first time I've thought to bring it. I actually dug it out there. So I, I brought the entrance music. So I thought that'd be, that'd be kind of cool. Now, as you might know, young man, how old are you? You're seven. Okay, I don't want to put any undue pressure on you, but you're going to ruin it for all of us. Because now I can't tell my good stories. Okay, so what I may ask your mom to do is at certain places, I may ask you to cover that young man's ears, okay? All right. All right. Thank you. I was pretty well known for going around. Uh, different states in the country, the world, sucking up to audiences everywhere I went. But I swear I mean it when I say, it's great to be right here in California, Pennsylvania. Yeah. As some of you might know, I had a match in Pittsburgh. Uh, Five years ago, right? Right? Right, you were in the fifth row? Okay, you were officially the 121st thousandth person I've met who claims they were there that night. That was a miracle. 121,000 people fit into the 18,000 seat arena to see the Hell in a Cell. Everyone says they were there. And unfortunately, I don't know, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's not, but uh, everything I had ever done before, or everything I will ever do in the future, means nothing because I was thrown off the cell. 
So now I go to talk to school groups. I try to talk to kids about the importance of literacy and accepting people for the way they are. And when I'm finished with these heartfelt talks, I'll say, okay, any questions? I'll say 100 kids raise up their hands, and I'll say, oh, by the way, it did hurt when the undertaker threw me off the cell. <laughs> and all the hands go down like that. I had a, a girlfriend from Pittsburgh. I know this isn't Pittsburgh, but it's kind of close, right? First of all, let me tell you what happened when I, when I landed. This was a little bit unusual for me. Uh, I was tired. I hadn't been sleeping that well. And I, I slept a little bit on the plane, and when I woke up, I don't know physiologically why this happens. It wasn't a sign of sexual arousal. I think I was overly tired. But there was a certain part of my body that had a little more blood supply in it than usual. <laughs> First, I thought about sitting down until it subsided, but the truth was I had that little waist pouch. I was wearing the Winnie the Pooh sweatpants, so it was kind of hidden. In truth, it wasn't all that prominent anyway. So I, I was waiting there, and as I'm going to get off, there was an elderly woman, maybe 65. I don't know. That's maybe not elderly, but she was, she was about in her mid-60s. And this poor woman lost her balance. And in attempting to regain her balance, she put her hand out <laughs> and went, Woo! <laughs> so I got her number. <laughs> She's out there somewhere. Uh, um, but I did. I had an imaginary girlfriend from Pittsburgh. I don't know how many of you know this, but I was, this is where I learned to wrestle, a little bit north of here in Beaver County. Yeah. One person from Beaver County? This guy loves beaver. And, uh, and I, uh, I made her up because I didn't want to tell my friends at school that I was actually trying to do this wrestling thing. I was afraid if they found out that I was wrestling that they would, they would make fun of me or they put undue pressure on me. There was already enough pressure. I wasn't a natural by any means. I was pretty lousy at this wrestling stuff. So I was afraid if they knew that it would ruin it for me, I'd lose the drive, that I'd lose the intestinal fortitude necessary to at least be uh, semi-successful. And so I claimed that every week I was leaving my school in upstate New York, driving to Pittsburgh, about 380 miles each way. And, and I did this, I did it for about a year and a half, my last year and a half in school, so that my, my final year when you're supposed to be living up as a senior, I think there was 32 weeks in the year, and I was only at school for three weekends. So while other people were out there in their college spring break in Daytona and Fort Lauderdale, I, I was in West Virginia being hit with steel chairs. And I created this girl, I think her name was Kathy. And about a half a year into this thing, I come home from wrestling, the abandoned Freedom Elementary School, and there's my, you, you know it? All right. There's my, my housemates, and they're out there, they're like looking at me like this. And I get out, I'm like, well, what's wrong? By this time, it's like, it's about like six o'clock in the evening. And he goes, you're wrestling. I said, no, I'm not wrestling. They said, we know you don't have a girlfriend. I said, what do you mean you know I don't have a girlfriend? And they start laying out the evidence, and I got to admit, it didn't look good. She said, they said, you say you have a girlfriend, but you never call her. She never calls you. You leave every Friday afternoon. You come back every Sunday afternoon. You smell like ears. Okay. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Got two sleeping bags in the car. Frequently uh, sporting bruises and black eyes and abrasions. Fast food wrappers all over the front seat. We know you're wrestling. And I wouldn't admit it. I wouldn't admit it until I finally had my first big match. I had one big match in Clarksburg, West Virginia. My second match was in Providence, Rhode Island against the British Bulldogs. 
and I came home and my front teeth were knocked in, not out. That happened a little bit later on in my life. My jaw ligament had been torn so that I couldn't chew solid food for a month. And I still gained weight. <laughs> and at that point, I was able to admit, yes, I've been wrestling because I felt like a success. So, you know, this is not a motivational speech by any means. This is uh, Mick Foley, not DDP you've chosen to see. <laughs> and uh, thank goodness. Uh, but I do believe, you know, in setting goals. And what I did, I set them, set them low and then expanded them as time went on. So that if I had only had that one match in Clarksburg, West Virginia, my house today would be filled with eight by tens of that magic moment when I took on Kurt Kaufman. And instead I went on three time WWF champion. <laughs> And I have one painting in the house. It's, it's, you know, anytime I really think about what I did, and anytime I'm doubting myself, I just kind of pull out my action figure. <laughs> Makes me feel really good. It's a strange thing happened when I pulled up here today in my long, sleek, silver college minivan they brought me here in. <laughs> I got out. Whoa. And there was, this, there was this kid, he was like nine or 10. He was a little older than this, he wasn't that guy. But man, he looked excited. He looked excited up until the moment that I stepped out of the car and then I realized he was kind of disappointed. And I said, hey there, pal. He goes, hi, Mick. <laughs> and I said, what's wrong? He goes, oh, nothing. I said, hey, come on, you can tell me anything. And he said, no, it's, it's not that I thought you were overrated and you just used lots of foreign objects to cover up for the fact that you really had very little actual wrestling talent. <laughs> I said, okay. He said, it's not that I think that Hell in the Cell was the most overrated match in wrestling history. And I said, oh, was it? I said, well, listen, son, why don't you just go home to your mom? And the kid says, I can't. And I wish I, I should have kept walking, but instead I turned around and I said, why not? He said, because my mother beats me. Is he here today, that kid? Did he make it? I guess not. I said, is it possible to live with your father? And he said, no. And I shouldn't have said why not, but I said why not. And I knew the answer. Do you know the answer? because his father beat him. And I said, well, man, I said, where do you live? And he said, that's it, Mick. When I heard that a WWE superstar was coming to, to the campus, I got really excited. And then I found out that it was you. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, who were you thinking it was? And I'm thinking he's going to say Rock or Undertaker or Triple H. He says, Al Snow. <laughs> said, Al Snow? He said, yeah, I want to live with him. I said, kid, why in the world would anybody want to live with Al Snow? And he looked up at me and said, because Al Snow has never beaten anybody. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. True story. Child abuse can be humorous. <laughs> Speaking of children, Halloween just passed, right? Big day. A lot of people know I'm a Christmas fanatic. I do have the year-round Christmas room. But I'm pretty big on Halloween, too. Pretty big on Halloween. And it always turns out to be a flop because I live in the middle of the woods. And with the exception of Soledad O'Brien's parents, I have no neighbors. True story. Do you know who she is? Okay. All right. We got a lot of news junkies here, huh? <laughs> no one's ever heard of Soledad O'Brien? Okay. One person. All right. Okay. So it's kind of a downer, you know? I mean, it's not quite the same driving to another neighborhood and then like walking around with your kids when nobody knows you. And even last year, I thought I had, I don't 
think I had. I know I had the greatest costume ever devised. My son was one and a half. Now he's two and a half. And I'm kind of reaching that area where I can't just use him as my own personal, you know, play toy. <laughs> like there was an instance when my wife, who was really into horse racing, she was watching the Kentucky Derby and getting really excited. So the little guy last spring equated his mom with the horses, which he expressed as mama whore. <laughs> so of course, as soon as he sees me laughing, now he thinks it's funny and he's walking around the house at one point going, mama whore, mama whore, mama whore. <laughs> Got kind of embarrassing. After all, I'm a best-selling author and my kid is mispronouncing words. I pull him aside and after a couple of minutes he came out and he said, mama, filthy rotten whore. <laughs> But I had the woman who used to make my tights. This guy's holding hands with two women. It's awesome. <laughs> the nature boys. There you, there you go, nature boys. Are that is cool. Um, I had the woman who used to make my tights. I, I sent her, I gave her my idea for the Halloween costume. And so I, 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 she rented The Wizard of Oz and then sends me back in the mail about a week later a completely authentic 100% legitimate lollipop kid outfit. <laughs> they call him the lollipop guild, but we always call him the lollipop kid. And he was too young to know how foolish he looked. <laughs> a year and a half old, and he's sitting there with the green tights with the little <laughs> green checkered vest. <laughs> I gave him a big lollipop <laughs> to hold on to. <laughs> I'm having more damn trouble with this cord here. <laughs> And not only that, I brought a boom box with me and I had the Wizard of Oz CD all hooked up. So every house we went to, do -do, do -do, do -do, we represent, and it was awesome, but it wasn't the same as I had no one really to share it with, you know what I mean? So this year when my wife came home, she got him an off the rack Care Bear outfit. Kind of boring, right? So I, I believed wholeheartedly in coming up with cool stuff for Halloween. So my son, you know, I tell my kids, look, you know, this is America. You, America, you can be anything you want to be. So he comes to me and he says, Dad, I want to be Alan Houston for Halloween. <laughs> he can be almost anything but a black guy. <laughs> and I think, you know, that'd be kind of offensive to try to put, like, black makeup on. So I said, Dewey, you know, that'd be kind of difficult. He said, why? He said, because, you know, I said, because Alan Houston's black. He says, no, he isn't. I said, yeah, I've watched him play. I'm pretty sure he is. Then he shows up with his basketball card. He says, see, it's pretty much what I suspected. Alan Houston is, he's a black guy, right? So he ended up being bloody scream instead, putting on the mask. And then, and then after two houses, he wants to, well, actually, that was two years ago. He wanted to be Jeff Hardy. Okay. So I gave him some illegal drugs. <laughs> now, want to be Jeff Hardy, and I get him a forty-dollar wig, and I spray paint it different colors. And he says, and he, uh, after two houses, it was warm there in New York, and he decides he doesn't want to be Jeff Hardy anymore, and he takes off the wig. I said, Dewey, you can't do that. He said, why? I said, because now you're not trick-or-treating. Now you're just walking around asking for free food. <laughs> you're begging. He said, but I still look like Jeff Hardy. I said, yes, uh, you look like Jeff Hardy when he was 10 with short brown hair. But we ended up having fun, and I ended up taking, I ended up going to a, a haunted house, and because they let me cut the line, which was at least two hours long, I had a volunteered to be mankind for him for about a half an hour. So I thought it would just be cool, and it's a great haunted house they have. That You open up the window, and here I come with the sock. I brought the sock and everything. Have a nice day! But the guy wanted me like walking around up and down the line so everyone knew that he had the real mankind in his house. And I'm walking around, I'm trying to remember how I did it, you know, with the old walk and the leer and all that stuff. And I'm walking, I'm feeling pretty good. I, people are going, oh, oh man, I, that, that's the real guy. I'm telling you, it's the real guy. And then I hear somebody say, man, he must have fallen on hard times. 
showing up at the haunted house to make a couple extra bucks on Halloween. <laughs> then I saw something on November 1st, because the kids wanted to go downstairs and want to count their candy and all that stuff. They want to divide it and subdivide it. My son's pretty big on statistics. He wants to write down how many Tootsie Rolls he has, how many Butterfingers. He falls asleep. He wakes up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm already up for some reason, and he's, he's peeing. <laughs> he usually pees with the door closed. This time the door was open, and I look in, and my son has not lifted the rim. <laughs> I'm a complete failure as a parent now. I said, dude, what are you doing? He goes, what do you mean? I said, you're peeing with the rim down. So? I, because I'm the guy that takes the blame for it, you know, and oh, there's pee on the seat. They figure it's dad. It's not dad. It's Dewey. <laughs> and I said, Dewey, how often do you do that? And he goes, sometimes. And then I think back to a time my wife called me into the toilet. And she said, this is like a year ago. She says, Mick, I want you to look at something. This is disgusting. And I'm called into the toilet, and I look at the bowl, and there's a couple turds in there. <laughs> and she goes, will you look at that? What do you mean? Well, I, yeah, I am looking at that. And he goes, well, what do you see? What am I, Columbo? I'm like, what, what do you mean? There's a couple pieces of poop floating around there. She goes, what do you not see? I said, my old title belt? <laughs> I don't know. A lot of things I don't see in there. My autographed picture of Test, which had been thrown in the toilet at one time. It turns out that what I don't see, toilet paper. So all of a sudden I realize, okay, maybe you could forget to flush the toilet accidentally but you don't forget to wipe your ass. <laughs> so I called him aside, I said, Dewey, I said, how often do you forget to wipe your hiney? And he said, sometimes. <laughs> but just to prove that he's not a bad kid, and I'm sure he would love me telling these stories to you guys, I'd like to tell a little story about my wife when she was pregnant. Some of you know that I have another child, right? Another seven, no, four children now, four children. My wife was pregnant, having a craving for grapefruits. So she says, Mick, will you go down and get me some grapefruits? So I do what every good father should do. I pawn it off on my kid. Dewey, go down and get your mom a couple grapefruits. He goes, I don't know what they are. So now flashback to 1997. The infamous Mankind JR interview, where they felt that the Mankind character hadn't been fully explained, and Vince really thought that people had some insight into what made the character click that people would really appreciate it. And they wanted me to come on without the mask and talk to the people like I'm talking to you now, but my character was actually fairly believable at the time, you know? Kind of scary. It's kind of hard to believe that I pulled that off. For, and kind of hard to believe that I wore my hair like that for 18 years also. And so what we did is we told, I told true stories, but I told them in character. And there was this one specific story I talked about back when I played lacrosse in high school. Rumor has it that I intentionally wore no padding. It wasn't intentional. I just happened to take my cup out, discard it while we ran our laps, and then I neglected to put it back in. So I don't know if anyone's ever played lacrosse or felt how hard that ball is. And try to imagine that ball skipping off the ground at about 85 miles an hour and making contact with the, uh, that region. <laughs> so when I was telling the story on the air, I was in character, you know, and I was all hunched over and I said, I said, am I testicle? which was groundbreaking because it had never been used on television before. St. Elsewhere tried to do a story about testicular cancer and they couldn't get away with it. St. Elsewhere couldn't get away with it, but I did. My testicle was the size of a grapefruit. I made it to school that next day. You know what I'm talking about, right? 
And it was the only time in all my high school years that I remember girls pointing at my genital area. <laughs> and I considered that to be the greatest day in the history of my life. Now this is back when Vince McMahon was just the announcer. And all of a sudden it was like he had a new toy to play with. Not literally, but it was like someone had broken the tea barrier. And now Vince was like at every length, this was like a five, three part interview, three, four part interview. And he's like, and JR, we're gonna hear more from mankind. Uh, should be interesting considering the story about his um, testicle. I don't think Vince ever got over it because when he became the evil Mr. McMahon, all of a sudden Vince becomes the guy with testicles the size of grapefruits. I should have copyrighted that story. Because then Vince, I mean, how often did he talk about that, right? I mean, that was his shtick the whole time. He was a grapefruit guy. So when my son claimed he didn't know what a grapefruit looked like, I told him to simply go down, open up the refrigerator, and when he saw things that looked like Vince McMahon's testicles, to pull them out. And he looked at me and he said, but Dad, I don't even know what Vince's testicles look like. <laughs> it's a true story. Now, this is just recently, as I mentioned, I started doing these, these college speeches, and it kind of brought back kind of bittersweet memories, especially because I, I went back to my old school. I'd been there in 96 when we wrestled in Syracuse, and I went like 30 miles south. And I went out downtown that night, but I hadn't actually been back at the campus since 87 when I graduated. So now it was weird to be walking along driving along actually looking at where I used to walk and I was like man there's the residence hall where I lived and there's old Maine where I took some of my classes and there's the Sperry Fine Arts Center and there's the hill that we used to have to walk up to class where I'd put on my headphones and hope that no girls talked to me because I was deathly afraid of being boring and then as we go down the hill I was like oh that's the moment that helped shape the rest of my life. And, and I, I wrote about this in Have a Nice Day, so I apologize if you heard this before. But this was a wonderful moment, December of 1983. And I was really shy when I was that age. I may have had a couple drinks in me, I don't know. But I know I was feeling good. And I do know it was the same night that Rocky Johnson, the father of the rock, and Mr. USA, Tony Atlas, won the WWF tag team titles from the Wild Samoans, who I was definitely in a mood to celebrate. And there was this girl who's in, in the book is called Kathy, even though that's not her real name. And she was somebody I could actually talk to. I felt comfortable around. And she was beautiful. At least I thought she was beautiful. And she asked me if I would walk her home. And Kathy had had a few more drinks than I had. So she was staggering a little bit as she walked up that hill. And I'm walking up, and it was kind of cold in upstate New York, third week of December. And all of a sudden, I'm walking, and I feel Joanne's hand in mine. Man, I've been still infatuated with holding hands, the significance that it holds. I wrote about it in my novel, Tedham Brown, which probably none of you have read yet. And I looked up, and man, the snowflakes were falling down softly, and the moon was shining through those flakes, casting a wonderful light on our blossoming love affair. And even though her hand was cold, the feeling in my heart was very warm. That's a little weak. <laughs> I get her up to the, her dormitory, and I'm not even going to try to weasel my way into a room because I know, at least I have the gut feeling, there's going to be plenty of time for that type of thing later. So all I do is I take the initiative for the first time in my life and I give her a kiss. No open mouths, no hot, wet, probing tongues. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, but this wasn't the type of kiss I delivered. It was delivered with just enough pressure to make it obvious that I wasn't kissing my aunt, for example. The perfect kiss. And I looked her right in the eye and I said, man, I had a great time tonight 
Kathy. <laughs> the hell is that? Is that a bird? <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I had a great time tonight too, Frank. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I was devastated, man. I was devastated. And there was no outlet for the type of emotional pain that I was feeling except to climb up on my bed and dive onto a stuffed animal on the cold, hard concrete below. And I was dead set on performing the superfly death leap on this poor, unsuspecting stuffed animal. So as I was walking, now the snowflakes are falling, but they don't look so damn beautiful anymore. The stupid moon was still shining through the flakes. Didn't look so good. But what did look good is I could see my hair in the shadow against the fine arts building, and it was starting to get long. And I wanted it to be long, because that way I could be like the superfly, and when he leaped, his hair went all over the place. He landed it. Well, looked unbelievable. Or as Vince McMahon would say, unbelievable. <laughs> I got up to my room, and I asked my roommate to do what I always ask him to do, which is take a camera and document this moment. So we did a little photographic essay, and for those of you who have, have a nice day. You can see the first picture on there looking a little sullen, very youthful, not a bad looking guy. For a guy who, who uh, claimed to be the ugliest wrestler in the world for many, many years, I really never looked that bad, right? Okay, thanks. <laughs> and I'm looking kind of sullen. And then the next picture, I'm like trying to jump out the window. And then I actually went downstairs and laid down in the snow like I had jumped out. It was a tremendously popular photographic essay, right? And then I, I had them, you know, put the dry ice in the air, which was baby powder, clouds of baby powder put on Blackfoot, Diary of a Working Man. I climbed up to my bed, and just as Ricky Medlock hit the high-pitched scream, and you all know Diary of a Working Man, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let me try to do the scream for you. <sighs> now there's a lot of pressure on me. Something like that. It's a lot better. He'd kill me if you he heard me doing that impression. And I do dove off that bed. Boom. And even though I knocked the wind out of myself, even though my rib cage hurt a little bit, man, I felt good inside. It's the only outlet that I knew. It felt so good that I knew we had to capture it on moving film. And I could either use the video cameras of that day, which were about this big. Right? <laughs> And you had to wear a battery pack around your waist so it looked like Batman's utility belt. <laughs> or I could borrow an eight millimeter camera, which I did. Now, the eight millimeter, eight millimeter camera needed a lot of light to shine on its subject. And we put that light on, it attracted a lot of attention. And I lived in a co-ed dorm, so you had your guys coming out from one end, the girls coming out from the other end. Generally speaking, the girls didn't pay a lot of attention to what I did, so it was kind of cool to have them peering in, you know? And here's the music playing, and the song's kind of cool. It starts slow, and it builds, and it builds. And we're putting billowing clouds of dry ice into the air. Baby powder, once again. And I know Ricky Menlock's about to hit the scream. So I climb up on my bed, but before I do, or as I do it, I've got this little thing of food coloring. Pour it in my mouth, very surreptitiously, secretively. And now I do the dive, and boom, I hit the ground, and as I do, I let that food coloring go. And I heard this great female voice go, the blood was everywhere. And that same voice said, that's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. And I remember thinking, yeah. Right? And though it may seem kindly, kind of silly, serial killer-esque at this point, looking back, I do distinctively remember thinking, you know what? If I can't attract women, I sure as hell can disgust them. <laughs> and I went on to do that for the next 17 years. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
Now that, that leap off the bed later turned into a leap off Danny Zucker's roof when we tried to really do it because the eight millimeter thing fell apart. You know, it didn't work. The film all went flying. It never was captured for posterity. So we finally did it when I went home. Did it outside, snowy winter day. And I ended up diving off Danny Zucker's roof. There was one thing you heard that came out lousy, right? For the most part, I speak pretty well for a guy with two missing teeth, but that <laughs> sound kind of gets caught once in a while. There was one thing <laughs> that I could take back and be that stupid dive off Danny Zucker's roof. Because I think, think, <laughs> that the average fan kind of conveniently forgot the part about me driving 760 miles round trip and sleeping in my car and living off a loaf of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the week. And they came to believe that I kind of jumped off Danny Zucker's roof and became a WWF superstar. I also think that they look at maybe like the top 10 most influential guys in wrestling in the late 90s when it was really popular. And I think if you were to line those guys up on the stage, you'd be looking at like The Rock, obviously, right? Stone Cold, Triple H, Hogan, Mean Street Posse. <laughs> and me. In other words, you'd have nine guys who look like they just jumped off the pages of a comic book and one guy who very well could be showing up to fix your refrigerator. <laughs> and I think people thought, hey, I know we can't look like those guys, <laughs> but I can look like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so therefore, this backyard wrestlers and all these amateur people, they, they come to look at me as their role model. And I've been asked over time, you know, do you feel responsible for any of this stuff that goes on? And I'm like, I, you know what? I don't know. There's got to be some accountability and some responsibility. And I think if, if a parent, you know, allows their kid to set up a very elaborate ring in the backyard, most of the time after telling their kid that, why do you watch that junk? It's all fake anyway. So little Junior goes outside and attempts to do moves that his mom has told him are fake. They have an, a little accident and they want to blame us, you know. Also, you know, if you, you're looking to, you know, you're making your lasagna and the cheese grater's missing and then little Joey comes in with half his forehead rubbed off. <laughs> Time for little Joey to find a new hobby. But nonetheless, even though I feel that way, over the years, the questions have kind of gotten to me. Do you feel responsible? Don't you think they're copying you? You're shaking your head no, right? But I think in one specific instance, I may not have taken into account just how impressionable a certain wrestling fan was. It wasn't so much something that I did as something that I said. And more so than the leap off Danny Zucker's roof, I think if I could take back anything, it would be that one stupid comment. It was a triple threat match inside a cage. Mankind, Ken Shamrock, The Rock. Kevin Kelly asked me how I would feel if a situation were to arise in which Ken Shamrock and The Rock would put aside their differences and double team me. And I looked right at that camera, once again, not understanding just how impressionable this one wrestling fan was. I looked right at the camera and I said, bring them on. I had no idea the president was watching that night. <laughs> No idea he'd be so damn impressionable. I thought I was entertaining fans. I didn't realize I was forming future foreign policy. <laughs> now, Jake Roberts once told me that a wise man knows where to steal his material. It makes a lot of sense, right? Just my personal opinion, and a couple of people can walk out if they want. Just my personal opinion that a wise man who runs the country shouldn't be stealing their material 
from me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I hate to say it, but sometimes I listen to the president, and when he's not carefully scripted, he does tend to say some, some dumb things. Right? Okay. And I thought, what would it be like, you know, like, if, say, I were called in to be his chief of staff, okay? And let's face it, you know he watches the show, okay? Let's stop kidding each other. The fact that his two twin daughters lost their Secret Service tail and showed up at Madison Square Garden, it's a pretty good indicator that W's watched a little wrestling in his life. And I really feel that somewhere around 1998, he was watching Raw. He saw Stone Cold Steve Austin. He looked really closely. He was the governor of Texas at the time. And he said, that's who I'm going to be. <laughs> if Vince McMahon hadn't copyrighted the name, he'd be calling himself the Ta Texas Rattlesnake right about now. So this is where I enter the proceedings. I'm going to help him as he prepares to debate Wesley Clark. And I say, OK, Mr. President, what are you doing? And he goes, <laughs> Mr. President, what did you just write down? And that's my, my opening line. I don't do a very good impression of anybody but Terry Funk. So for the time being, George Bush will be played by Beavis, OK? <laughs> Let me see it. Ah, <sighs> oh, Mr. President. Hey, what's wrong? You don't think it's good? You can't start out the debate by saying, let me tell you something, brother. <laughs> it's bad enough when you started off the State of the Union by saying, if you think I ought to bomb Iraq, give me a hell yeah. <laughs> and I say, what are you doing? And I look at him. He's putting on this ridiculous outfit. What the hell is that? Putting on the flight suit. But you look like a jerk. Got to show him tough in defense. But Mr. President, you're debating Wesley Clark. He's a general, a four-star general, he was supreme allied commander of NATO. Yeah, I flew a plane during the Vietnam War. Yeah, but you flew that plane in Texas while the war in Vietnam was going on. Wesley Clark was in the war. He was shot four times. Four shots, huh? <laughs> I took more than four shots lots of times. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, you did, but those shots were taken in a bar <laughs> back when you were a stumbling drunk. I wasn't a drunk. I just drank heavily which is the definition of a drunk. I wasn't a drunk. You were a drunk. I wasn't a drunk. You were a drunk. Who's the president here? Me or you? Uh, Mr. This is... I said, who are the American people like president? Me or you? Well, actually... <laughs> they, they didn't elect either one of us president. Listen, why don't we just skip defense, okay? You can't take Clark on a defense. Let's think of something else, something else you're strong at. Education. When I was governor of Texas, we were number one in education. No, no, you weren't. Yes, I was. Number one. No, you were number 49. You sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, I know I was number one in something that started with the letter E. It's executions. You were number one in executions. That's it. I'll call myself the excellence in execution. <laughs> no, it's, it's taken. It's trademark. Bret Hart has it. I forgot what I was going to say next. But uh, 
Then he concludes by saying, and that's the bottom line because W said so. That's just my little take on the president. I hope you're not offended. I know a lot of you, most of you did not show up to hear my political views or hear me do a terrible imitation of our president. You came here to talk about, hear about my experiences in Nigeria, right? <laughs> right? Okay. Well, this kind of ties into the book. I looked at the poster, because I don't know what I'm supposed to talk about when I get here. I kind of have a free forum, and it said, Mick will talk about his experiences in wrestling and writing. No one wants to hear about my experiences writing, right? But it also said I was going to talk about being the host of Robot Wars, and I'm not going to address that tonight. <laughs> but I did think I'd, I'd talk about the significance of my trip. I actually took a few trips to Nigeria. And, and the fact that they have some different type of customs. I also learned a valuable lesson about hitting the Nigerian champion with a big cow's bone in a country where everyone thinks wrestling is real. Not a smart decision. Next thing I know, I was being bludgeoned with a chair, and I was climbing into the ring, where, which was surrounded by about 16 militia men, or army men, with their, with their automatic rifles. And they were all too caught up in the match to help me out. So luckily, they had about 10, 12 of the Nigerian wrestlers who thought I was cool. And they came out and helped me. They thought I was cool because I was one of them because I had brought them like 12 t-shirts from the States. And when I gave those guys the t-shirts, I went in to use the restroom, I came back a minute later, every last one of them had the new t-shirt on. They weren't new anyway, they were things that I'd grown out of. <laughs> that didn't matter. Now a strange thing about Nigeria is that the guys hold hands with other guys. It's considered a sign of friendship. But I considered it kind of weird when I was walking along and felt my hand entwined with that of flash mask Udor. <laughs> I didn't quite know what to do. This was after that hand-holding experience with Kathy. Didn't seem quite the same. But I didn't know how to break it to him. But after about a mile and a half of this, I said, listen, Flash, you know, we don't hold hands with guys in our country. You know, we, that's, that's what we do with our girlfriends. And all of a sudden he says, you guys holding hands together? <laughs> that flash mask Udor for the night? And, all right. And he says, you can repeat after me. He goes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean any disrespect. Not mean any disrespect. Very good. And as we're walking, I realized that, hey, this was a gesture of respect and really quite a compliment to have a, an older black man from Africa embracing, <laughs> embracing a younger white man from a different continent in his local custom. So when I had a chance to write my book and I had this ghostwriter helping me out, we rode together for like three days and he was writing down all this stuff and I thought there was going to be a problem because after three days he said, he showed me the opening page of his book and I read it and I remembered verbatim. It said, I was baptized Michael Francis Foley, a typical Irish name if ever there was one, but my family was not the typical Irish vision of free flowing beer on Saturdays and church on Sundays. Heck, I didn't even make my first communion until I was 19 an age when most of the guys in the block already had their first girlfriend. I mean, what kind of a girl would want to go out with a guy who hadn't made his communion? And he said, what do you think, Michael? I tell him I'm a writing fool. And I said, well, there's a couple little problems with it. He goes, what are they? I said, well, first of all, I said, first of all, most of the guys in the block had their first girlfriend when they were like 12. He goes, oh, okay, I can change that. And I said, second, man, I, I don't think that having your communion is a prerequisite for dating. It's like, can you imagine a bunch of girls like going, oh, Mick is so cute. Yeah, but he hasn't had that first communion yet. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, right? 
Okay, I can change that. What else? I said, well, I, I didn't actually say any of that stuff. He goes, I know that's what I do. I take some of what you say and then I make the rest up. It's called creative license. I wrote Willie Mays' autobiography. I only talked to him for half an hour. <laughs> Holy crap. Maybe this seems a little weird coming from a guy uh, in the world of professional wrestling, but that, that seemed kind of fake to me. You know what I mean? So the next few days were spent in the dressing room. He was tagging along. And he was trying to make repairs. And I was suggesting things to him. And the first thing I suggested, I said, look, he'd written that story, the one I told you about Flash Mask Udor. He'd written that pretty much verbatim. And I thought it was a good story, you know, about the guy, uh, black man from Africa embracing a younger white man from a different continent in one of his local customs. And I said, I later came to see it as the ultimate measure of respect. And that was pretty good, right? And then I said, okay, Lou, how about this? How about either that or he wanted to hammer me? <laughs> and the guy says, I can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, because it's disgusting. And I said, yeah, but that's the way I talk. <laughs> They're really not disgusting words, but the thoughts are disgusting, right? Okay. And he goes, I can't do it. Edge was over there going over a match with Christian and Albert. And I said, hey guys, listen to this story. And I tell him the story about the ultimate measure, gesture of respect, measure of friendship, large black man, older black man from Africa, embracing a younger white man from a different continent and his local custom. And they nod, oh, good. Either that or he wanted to hammer me. <laughs> the guys bust out laughing. And the writer says, all right, I'll do it, but I don't agree with it. Then we're looking a little more. And it says, when I was 10, I wanted to be like the Fonz. That's what it said. And I said, maybe we should explain who the Fonz was. And he says, well, who was he? Oh, so, well, a little bit of a generation gap here. Bad sign when he's calling me Michael. The name reserved for when my mother was really, really mad at me and my first meeting with Vince McMahon when he didn't know any better. <laughs> how is Mike? He kept saying. So I said, how about this? How about we say, when I was 10, I wanted to be like the Fonz of TV's happy days. No doubt about it, the Fonz was the man. Fix a jukebox with a slap of his palm, no problem. And chicks, the Fonz had them lined up out the door. Right? One of the pleasures of my life is seeing my son watching the Fonz on Nick at Night and knowing that he thinks the Fonz is every bit as cool as I did. He says, okay, okay, that's good. And I said, at the end, put hey with like three Y's in it. He says, I can't do that. I said, why not? He said, because it's not a complete sentence. <laughs> so I go over to Edge. Guys, what did the Fonz used to say? And they all go, Hey, all right, I'll do it, but I don't agree with it. And then he handed me the book a couple weeks later, the first five chapters. I think everybody at one point or another has thought about what their life would look like in book form, right? Well, I had my life in book form, and it was pretty damn boring. Horrible feeling to read your life and say, hey, this couldn't be true. I couldn't have lived a life this dull. So I started thinking to myself, and I thought, you know what, maybe I can't write any other book, but I can write this book. So I went upstairs at the Tallahassee Civic Center. I got there about four hours early. And I had a legal pad, a yellow legal pad and a pen, because I don't even know how to turn on a computer, or a woman for that matter. <laughs> I just started writing. Writing about, started writing about losing my ear and Germany. I thought, that's a cool story. People want to know about that. Be another way for me to disgust women of a whole new generation. <laughs> and I thought it was good, but then again, I'd taken a lot of shots to the head. And what did I know? I went into the, uh, the locker room and I told guys like uh, Austin, hey, you want to hear what I wrote? Yeah, sure, kid. And I start reading. There's like two people around. And they're all laughing at the same time, the right time, cringing when the time is right. Austin starts crying at just, all right, maybe he didn't start crying. <laughs> but as people saw his reaction, I think 
think it was X-Pac with him, people started flocking around, you know? And it was a wonderful feeling. Like, oh, man, this is great. This is like wrestling without the pain involved. So it was pretty cool, you know? Now, when I wrote these autobiographies, I tried to stay positive. Unless someone had really screwed up my life, I tried not to bury them too bad. I tried not to dwell on the negative. But the truth was, over the course of 16 years and traveling around the world, I'd met some pretty miserable people and seen some pretty lousy things. But I couldn't put them in the autobiography. That's where writing a novel comes in. You can change things just enough. And I got inspiration for this one part of my story. I'm guessing nobody has the novel here. Does anyone have it? Cool, all right. I might quote from it here in a second, all right? And I was in Southeast Asia on the Mick Foley Southeast Asian trip. Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. Anyone know much about Malaysia? It's got a lot of poverty in the country, but at the same time has some of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. The best airport, nicest hotel I've ever been in. So nice that it was a shame I could only spend six hours a night there because he had me working 18 hour days. Biggest skyscraper and up to that point. I think they've built a taller one in Taipan now. And when I went for my autograph session, they had the world's greatest shopping mall. I walked out and there's like a sea of people out in front of me. Thousands of people, as far as I can see. Then I hear cheers coming from up above my head and I look over and there's like rotundos or whatever they call them. Going up five or six levels high and everywhere I look up it's like a Stanley, Stanley Kubrick movie. There's people chanting my name from way above my head. Foley, Foley, pretty cool. There's just too damn many people to greet, so I'm trying my best and I wade out into the sea, thinking nothing of my own safety. And I'm shaking with my hand, I'm shaking hands, shaking hands, but there's too many to shake with just one hand. So I'm shaking with the right and I shake with the left and I shake with the right and I shake with the left and I hear a father say, not with the left. Hey, that's kind of weird, what a grouch that guy is. I continue to wade in, right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand, not with the left, another father. Probably five or six times I hear them admonishing their kids not to shake with the left. So at the end of the tour, I asked the promoter, I said, hey, what's the deal with that left hand thing? And he says, oh, nothing. He starts to turn away. So I get kind of 1996 mankind on him. I said, what's the deal with the left hand? Does anyone out here know what the deal with the left hand is? Oh. No, it's not. Anyone else know? Okay, yeah, the left hand would indeed be the designated ass-wiping hand. Does anyone want to guess if they do that wiping with or without the benefit of toilet paper? Apparently, when someone steals and has their hand cut off, they cut off the right hand. And it's not the pain and agony of having the hand cut off. It's the indignity of being forced to go through life eating with the ass wiping hand. <laughs> True story. So I suddenly become a little bit germaphobic. And as I get home, there's an article right about the same time in USA Today stating that 75% of all men do not wash their hands after using the restroom facilities. The women, that doesn't apply to you. At least I hope not. And I'm realistically reading this article thinking, all right, if 75% of the general public doesn't wash their hands, well, the percentage of wrestling fans is probably going to be a little bit higher. <laughs> wrestling was at its absolute peak, and I swear to you, everywhere I went, there was a guy doing this to me. Not just wanting to shake my hands, but announcing his intention as he did it. I've got to shake your hand. <laughs> For two years, I walked around like this. Oh, wow. That signifies an injury. Does it look like an injury to you? Uh, that was my injured hand. One out of three people would then go with the left. I was miserable. 
everywhere I went, no matter how many times I washed my hands, no matter how, many, how much of that Prell liquid stuff that I used, antibacterial, there were just too many damn handshakers out there. I had to do something and I had to do it quick. So I did what any hardcore icon, one ear missing, three teeth knocked out, 325 stitches guy would do. I went to my mother. <laughs> and I said, Mom? And she said, yes. And I said, I'm shaking so many people are not washing their hands. I use the bathroom. I'm going to shake my hands. I got poop on my hands. I rub my eyes. Poop on my eyes. I hate the kids, and there's poop on the kids' body. She said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, what I want to do is go on TV and tell the wrestling fans I'm not shaking hands until that percentage changes a little bit. And she said, you can't do that. And I said, why not? She said, because you're a good guy. Shit. I was a good guy. I couldn't do that. So the next TV taping, I see Kurt Angle. I see Chris Jericho. I said, guys, come here. I start telling them my plan. And as I'm talking, from out of nowhere, Vince McMahon. I think I shook his hand? You're damn right I shook his hand. It's a hand that signs my checks after all. Angle and Jericho never took my advice. Therefore, the whole thing went unsolved until I wrote this book. Could I have that? You didn't bring it? Somebody brought it. I saw it. Could someone bring that up here? All right. Thank you. Thank you. This is where the writer's revenge comes in. And at this point in the story, young Andy Brown at 17 is going to go to a football game with his girlfriend. It is the first time that his father will meet Andy's girlfriend and Andy's girlfriend's mother. Andy has some reservations about it because his dad's a little on the strange side. Dad. Please don't embarrass me, I said. And don't hit on Terry's mother. Cheatham smiled as we walked toward the door. Hey, he said, Andy, I told you I wouldn't embarrass you, didn't I? But as far as the mother goes, I can't guarantee nothing. Mrs. Johnson met us at the door with a forced smile that did little to hide her shock and, I thought, disgust. She opened the door and said, well, hello, you must be Andy's father. I sure am, ma'am. I'm Tatum Brown, he said, and leaned in and gave Mrs. Johnson a firm kiss on the cheek. Well, Mr. Brown, that was nice of you, although to tell the truth, I think a handshake would have sufficed. Yeah, well, myself, personally, I try not to shake hands too much. You know, for sanitary reasons. People can be a little gross, right? Like, say I was out in the car adjusting my balls. <laughs> and then shook your hand. Well, I'd pretty much be slapping my balls in your hand, wouldn't I? <laughs> it's true. It's damn true. I'm going to be looking to see if anyone takes a secret plunge down there. I'd like to shift gears a little. And you know what? This is the last story I'm going to tell, and then we're going to take questions, and then I have my favorite story to tell after that. Because what happens if you take questions, and that's the end of it, you can say, all right, last question, and then the guy asks a lousy question. Then it's a downer, you know what I mean? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the story, take some questions, and then for those of you who are keeping score at home, this is what I consider to be Mick Foley's greatest hit. hit. It is the Al Snow Montreal suplex story. Right, okay. It's worth, worth waiting around for. Somebody uh, here at the college said that he read something and he said that story is even better when told live. And it's pretty good in the book. But I think you guys are really loving it. So I think it's going to touch a lot of your hearts. <laughs> <laughs> All 
I'm kidding, but I do hope this story, this next story, if there's one thing that you could take with you, be this one. This is a uh, story of me and this kid, and maybe a story about some per personal growth on my part. In that, the entire time I was wrestling, I promised myself I was going to do more to help kids. And in a way, when wrestling was real hot, we were helping kids. Because we had kids around us all the time, you know, Make-A-Wish kids, other wish-granting organizations. People wanted to be around the wrestlers. And even though they usually wanted to see The Rock or Stone Cold, the fact was I was still around and I always thought I was good with kids. When I retired, the kids weren't around anymore. And that's what I missed the most. So I started making some phone calls and I started talking to kids about literacy and things like that. But I also wanted to hang out with kids who I thought had suffered throughout their lives. So I started volunteering some time and worked with kids who uh, had cancer, kids with um, neuromuscular diseases, kids who'd been abused, things like that. And one of the things I really liked doing was the personal Mick Foley Smackdown visit, where I would come over to watch Smackdown Usually not raw, because that got over later. And for the price of a pizza, the kids got to spend two quality hours in which I would do everything but acknowledge the condition they were in. It was a safety net, because I didn't have to talk about anything but wrestling. We were definitely spending quality time, but I did think to myself, you know what, one day there may come a time when a kid is going to ask you a difficult question that doesn't deal with The Rock or doesn't deal with Vince McMahon, and you're not going to have a clue. So I started doing a little bit of reading. I took a seven-hour workshop that the American Cancer Society offered called Good Grief. And what I got out of these readings, what I got out of this workshop was that kids or people who have challenged in different ways generally like to talk about the challenges facing them. So there's this kid named Brian. And I was afraid that Brian wouldn't want me telling this story, but when I spoke to his school, and he's at a school for, for kids with physical challenges, he was asking me, can you tell the story? Can you tell the story? So I figure if he doesn't mind me telling it in front of his friends, he's not going to mind me telling it to you. I'd been over Brian's house probably about six times. Never spoken to him about a, a word about anything outside of wrestling. And he's about to have a major operation. This kid was born under some pretty difficult circumstances. He was a twin. His brother was born perfectly healthy, and his mom died giving birth to them. So not only has he had to fight his whole life, but he's probably had a certain, I'm imagining, certain sense of guilt over his mom's death. So when he asked me if I would go to the Islanders game with him a week before his big operation, I was more than happy to because the kid was really bent over in his chair. It was very painful. This operation was going to help him sit up straight. So we get to the hockey game. His dad drives us in the specially equipped van, drops us off like we're on a big date. <laughs> Brian's 15. We sit down in the special section. I'm kind of out of my safety zone here, you know. There's a hockey game going on. I don't know, even know that much about hockey. If it was a wrestling match, I'd be okay. So I'm trying to think of something like semi-cool to say. So I turn to him and I say, hey, <laughs> how does it feel to be part of my posse? He kind of nods his head. Then like five minutes later, he taps me on the shoulder. He says, Mick, and I said, yeah. And he said, am I really part of your posse? I looked at him and I said, you better believe you are. I didn't actually have a posse. <laughs> he was the one and only member of the posse. But you know what, I figured, all right, here's my time. My heart's kind of beating. Like, I'm going to start asking him about his operation. And I say, hey, Brian, big operation, you know. Man, how you feel about it? And all of a sudden, this kid starts opening up to me about all his fears and his dreams, his ambitions. All these things I never knew before. And he said, you know, it's just too bad I've already had my wish, because otherwise maybe some Islanders could come visit me in the hospital. So I said, you know, Brian, I, I work with this group called the Marty Lyons Foundation. What they do is they grant second wishes. Because as great as Make-A-Wish is, you know, if a kid's got some, some troubles and some um, life-threatening illness, and he gets a wish at three, and he's still struggling with it all his illness at 10, 11, 12. It kind of helps out to have another wish come in your way. Take your mind off your problems a little bit. So I tell him about this group, and Brian gets this look in his eye, like this faraway look, and he says, I'd like to meet Metallica. 
So I said, ah, is that the type of music you like? He said, yeah. And I said, do you like uh, Twisted Sister? Yeah. You guys know Twisted Sister, right? Yeah. Dee Snyder was on the news. Arnold Schwarzenegger was doing the air guitar with him, <laughs> looking very gubernatorial, <laughs> lip syncing. No, Dee wasn't, but Arnold was singing, we're not going to take it. And Brian says to me, he goes, do you know Dee Snyder? And the truth is, I've met a lot of famous people in my life. And I consider them my friends as long as I've said hello and shook their hand. <laughs> truth is, Katie Couric's not actually my friend. Which doesn't mean that one day she, she couldn't be. If we were to get to know each other a little bit better, maybe spend some time together. And, Maybe have a drink sometime. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I've only got two real friends who are famous. One is Kevin James, the King of Queens, who I went to high school and college with. The other one is Dee Snyder. As it turns out, Dee Snyder owes me a favor. It's not just like a, can you run out to the store and pick me up some butter type of favor. It's a can you drive eight hours round trip and do my radio show for free so I can star in the VH1 adaption of the Senate lyrical hearing? So that's where they slapped the parental advisories on. He played himself and did a very good job at it. So he owed me a favor. So I call him up and I say, D, I need a favor. So we show up at the hospital. I pick up D Snyder in my long, sleek, silver Chevy Impala car. <laughs> and while I conceivably could be the guy who shows up to fix your refrigerator, this guy is obviously somebody. You may not know that he's a rock and roll guy, but you know he's somebody. He had the long, blonde ponytail. He had the, the knee-length leather duster. Knee-high cobra skin boots. Black leather pants that I wouldn't be caught dead in. <laughs> we get to the hospital. I tell them to kind of hang outside, like just outside the door. I walk into the room, and the kid is playing Twisted Sister on a CD player. And I'm like, yeah, this is perfect. And I talk to him for like five minutes, and he's pretty excited. But let's face it, he's seen me six or seven times. It's not really a big deal anymore. And he said, yeah, I thought maybe D would call me, because that's what I said. Maybe I'll try to have D call him. And I said, oh, well, you know, D's kind of busy. You know, I'm sure he'll, if he can, he'll get around to it. I said, hold on a second, I gotta get something. And I walk outside the room, and when I come back, I've got D Snyder with me. And the kid looks up and he says, oh my God. One of the greatest reactions I've ever been a part of. And I've been a part of some pretty good reactions. Some pretty good cheap pops in my day. This topped them all. And D didn't just sit there, and, hey kid, he didn't just do that. He pulled up a chair and he leaned forward and proceeded to tell this kid stories about the road and the glory days of Twisted Sister for about an hour and a half. And then we get ready to go. And I drop D off at his house after he picked up some muffins for his family at his favorite bake shop. <laughs> And I, hey, D, see you later. Hey, thanks, man. Punches me in the shoulder. Playful punch. And he gets ready to leave. And he's walking away, and I'm getting ready to drive away. And then I see him, like, he puts his hand up, like, stop. And he comes walking over to the window. And I roll down the window. And he looks at me, and he says, Mick. I said, yeah. He said, I just want to thank you for making me a better man. So the next time I come to a school, I want to be introduced as three-time WWE champion, two-time New York Times number one best-selling author, a guy who's been interviewed twice by Katie Couric, <laughs> and the man responsible for making Dee Snyder a better man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, yes. Uh, what made you create Sokka? Oh, I wish you wouldn't have said that. <laughs> so unfortunately, now I have to give credit to Al Snow.
You know what? This was at a time when Vince McMahon was in the hospital. He was hooked up to a heart monitor and a respirator for a bruised ankle. Uh, and, uh, and I was supposed to go visiting him as mankind. The idea was that I loved Vince, but he hated me, and I didn't know it. So I was attempting to cheer him up, and all he was going to do was make him angry. And I had like a whole potpourri of horrible hospital gifts. I had a box of chocolates that was two-thirds eaten. I had uh, a, 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 the clown, Yerpel the clown, who was going to make balloon animals, remember? And I even said, you know, hey Vince, I've got some female entertainment, and I think you know what I mean. And Vince, uh, so she does a trick with a dog that you won't believe. And then in comes Yerpel the clown. And while Yerpel was doing her thing, Al had suggested that I bring a sock puppet. He was like, everybody hates sock puppets. They're ridiculous, right? And I had no idea when I came out with that sock puppet and did that horrible ventriloquist thing. Hi, I'm Mr. Socko. Mr. Socko's going to kiss the boo-boo. And then Bo Vince was going, don't, don't, don't kiss the boo-boo. Don't. And I leaned over and I fell on his ankle and he kicked me out of the room. And then when I left, as I was leaving, what really made the whole thing work is the camera went to him and he went, Mr. Socko. And the next day, I go to East Lansing, Michigan, or Detroit, and there are Socko signs everywhere. I come out to wrestle, and people were chanting Mr. Socko's name, and it became the biggest thing I'd ever been a part of. Uh, and I have Al Snow to thank for it. So right, with that in mind, let me tell you a, a heartwarming story. And this child with this book will not get it back. Now, nah, here you go. OK. This story has its origin in October of 99, driving down a long, lonely road, stretch of road between Louisville and Cincinnati. Been on the road for a while, and I need something to cheer me up. So I'm listening to Nat King Cole sing Oh Holy Night. Al Snow and I are duetting in the front seat. <laughs> oh Holy Night's kind of a challenging song, best not attempted by rank amateurs like us. You want to sing it with me? Oh, holy night, the stars are gently shining. You guys suck. <laughs> You're about as happy as our guy in the back seat who yelled, turn that crap off. So what do you mean crap? He said, turn it off. It's not Christmas time. I said, Bob, I look at the back seats, Bob Holly, the world's most miserable man. <laughs> I said, Bob, this isn't like Santa Claus is coming to down or Rudolph, you know. This is Oh Holy Night, this is a spiritual song suitable for year-round listening. Besides, it's within 10 weeks of Christmas, which clearly makes it Christmas season. I don't care, turn that crap off. So we stop. For food, undoubtedly at an IHOP, because it's the only place that Al would eat, and he ordered the same stupid meal everywhere he went. Egg white omelet with turkey in it. Bob Holly ate 77 egg whites in one sitting. I had the Rudy Tootie fresh and fruity. <laughs> we got back in the car, and I don't care what Bob Holly thinks, I'm going to listen to Christmas music. And I said, Al, do you have the Elvis Christmas tape? And Bob says, you've got Elvis? <laughs> so five minutes later, the guy who claimed to hate everything to do with Christmas was tapping his feet, snapping his fingers, and going, oh, here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus. <laughs> At about the same time, Bob developed a little crush on one of our valets named BB, the EMT. You guys remember BB? Okay. And he liked to hear that story. All of a sudden, he liked to have me making fun of him. And for like a month, everywhere I went, he was like, Mick, can you tell that story? I was getting so sick of that stupid story. But then we're in Montreal in November. It's an afternoon show, and I have got a four-corner tag team match I'm participating in. Me and Al Snow, known collectively as the best friends. An exaggeration even by wrestling standards against Bob and Crash Holly, the APA, Bradshaw and uh, Farouk, and Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley. 
And I'm trying to figure out ways I can get out of this thing without getting further hurt because by this time in my career, my knees are feeling terrible, my back hurts, I've taken way too many shots to the head during my career, and all I want to do is get out of there without pain. I see Al changing. He's putting his singlet on. Singlet is a one-piece wrestling outfit. And oddly, Al is not wearing underwear underneath this singlet. And I said, Al, you don't wear underwear under there? He goes, no, it shows lines on TV. I was going to tell him that, hey, we're not on TV tonight. It's an afternoon show. And instead, I held my tongue. And I hear Bob go, Mick, can you tell that story? And I said, all right, in a second, but let me talk to you first. Al actually looks over and he sees me huddled with Bob Holly, looking at him. He goes, what are you guys doing? I said, nothing. He goes, I know you're up to something. I said, I swear, all right, but I know you're up to something. <laughs> so I formed this game plan. Do you have that mannequin head back there? Okay. I formed this game plan. I'm in the ring for a couple minutes doing embarrassing stuff, belittling my legendary status. And I finally, I have Crash Holly in the ring and I hip toss into his own corner, which is kind of a disrespectful thing to do, but I had bigger plans. Crash tags Bob, I tag Al, who comes in with that stupid help me written backwards on his head. Like, <laughs> what it should say is lamb being led to slaughter. Because that's essentially what Al was about to be. He goes to tie up with Bob, and Bob boom, kicks him in the stomach as hard as he can. Should come as no surprise to those of you who have seen Bob Holly on Tough Enough 3 kicking poor Matt Capaletti's teeth in, right? That's just the way Bob does it. People are begging for a street fight after doing a fake wrestling match with Bob Holly. <laughs> he then goes to suplex Al. He puts one arm around his neck, the other one on his singlet, as it's supposed to be. But before Bob boosts Al into the air, he adds a little extra. He adds a little bit of this. <laughs> Thereby exposing Al Snow's very modest private parts. <laughs> but they're still kind of bent over. So the crowd's not in on it yet. Now there's two ways to do a suplex. There's the lazy, weak guy way that I did, where you just kind of get some pretty decent leverage and you kind of just go and you boost him over. Not all that impressive. Then there's the way that Bob chose to suplex Al that afternoon in Montreal. Straight up in the air. And he held him there. And he didn't just hold him there, he started doing this with Al. And it was amazing to see because section by section, the fans in Montreal got a look and they all went, Ooh. Now, for those of you who've played Little League, high school sports, junior high school sports, you can, you know that a singlet or a jock strap, which does much the same thing, is, is very useful for protecting the, the guys, keeps them safe from harm. It's not that effective, however, at showcasing the male anatomy in a very flattering light, which is why, if you're like me, and I know you are. When nobody's looking, or you think nobody's looking, you kind of give a quick tug to free that thing from its childlike state. <laughs> the black guys have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> now, unfortunately for Al Snow, he didn't have occasion to fit a secret tug 
into the night's agenda. He was trying. But all those years of 77 egg white meals had taken their effect in Bob Holly. Bob was strong. He was fighting Al every step of the way. And he had that singlet to the side, and he wasn't letting go. So therefore, high in the air, in full view of 18,000 screaming, nauseous Montreal wrestling fans, Al Snow was suffering from what George Costanza might have called significant shrinkage. <laughs> also, unfortunately for Al, he didn't subscribe to the modern method of male grooming. If you've ever seen a 70s adult film, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and therefore, from my vantage point, I saw what appeared to be a sparrow's egg inside a hideous vulture's nest. <laughs> it should have been one of the great moments of my career, maybe the greatest moment of my career, but instead all I could do is feel bad. <laughs> Truth is, if it was me, except for that vulture's nest thing, it wouldn't have been all that more, much more flattering. But Al Snow, to his credit, when he was finally released from the suplex, when he finally hit the canvas a good 20 seconds later, Al was actually laughing. What a great sport. And I'm thinking to myself, if he had seen what I just saw, <laughs> he wouldn't be laughing. So that's the Al Snow suplex story. I'm glad you stuck around for it. I know I talked forever and I really enjoyed being here. And uh, walk safely. <laughs> Anyone driving? Okay. And th thank you very much. I like doing this stuff, and uh, it's great to, to talk to people who like it. Thanks. Thank you.